So this is, as I said, is my is just my report on the Palestinian Israeli um, perspective. So there's going to be a chance for you to interact in this uh, presentation as well. So I hope we can make this into a uh, discussion as well, not just simply a presentation. So uh, okay, let's let me just review the geography of what we're talking about. The actual state of Israel is goes a little bit further south than this picture does, but for our purposes. <coughs> This is the state of Israel, it's on the Mediterranean Sea. You can see the Gaza Strip in the lower left-hand corner, and you see what looks like a big kindy beam, and that is the West Bank. And all the area in sort of that light tan is uh, Jerusalem, what I will call Jerusalem proper. So the area that the West Bank is that's gray is, is under military occupation of Israel, as is the Gaza Strip. So those are just get your bearings on the geography. This is what we're talking about. You can see the, the city of Jerusalem, right, sort of at the, the belly button of the kidney bean, if you want to call it that. And Bethlehem is just five miles from that little dot inside the West Bank. And that's where I spent most of my time. So, um, so that's the visual going on there. But let's just get our bearings. And this is really about a 20,000 foot overview of the history. It's much more complicated. And again, if you want more information on the Israeli narrative, the Palestinian narrative, and the Christian narrative, uh, I have about six hours of lectures that I've done on all of these that I can make available. Just text me or chat with it. It's on our church's website. But anyway, since October 7th, just so we're talking about what most of us are concerned about, there have been nearly 1,500 Israelis killed. There were 1,100 that were plus killed on October 7th, and then the rest of these Israelis have been through uh, either military campaigns or the uh, skirmishes that are attributed related to the tensions related to the um, uh, Israeli Hamas war. On October 7th, they took two, um, Hamas took 251 hostages. 105 of them were released in the prisoner swap in November. About six have been rescued, and there's of the ones that are left, uh, they're fairly sure that a couple dozen have already died, but it's still not confirmed how many living hostages are left. And of course, for I think the whole world uh, condemned this activity, this violence by uh, Hamas that they went over the border into Israel proper. Just to give you a reminder, this little teeny strip down on the left-hand side is the, the uh, Gaza Strip and Hamas crossed this border into this area right in here, and that's where all that mayhem took place. Um, since October 7th until yesterday, these are the st active statistics that I could find online, almost 38,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza. About 86,000 plus have been wounded in Gaza. There have been nearly 500 Palestinians killed in the West Bank. We don't hear much about that. We'll probably hear more of those numbers about Gaza and thousands and thousands of Palestinians have been imprisoned in what they call administrative detention um, in Israel. What that means is that Israel, uh, all they have to have is the suspicion of sus any kind of suspicious activity. They can arrest a Palestinian or arrest anyone who's under, who's living under military occupation. And they do not have uh, under military occupation in Israel. That means they can be detained without charge and without evidence and without access to a lawyer indefinitely. So what we see is the thousands of Palestinians and the hostages, the Israeli Jewish hostages, are what the uh, peace agreements or the ceasefires are all about. Hamas demanding that many of these Palestinians uh, be released, and of course Israel demanding that the hostages um, be returned. So anyway, that's just sort of the overview of October 7th, since October 7th. But just let's just kind of remember what's going on on the context. In the early 20th century, Zionist movement uh, was gaining traction. Uh, in 1917, um, after World War I, this whole region was split up. It used to be under Ottoman um, oversight for 500 years. And then the British came into this area, what they called the British Mandate for Palestine. The Brits promised Arab autonomy in this area. They also promised a Jewish homeland two promises that really are in tension with each other. The Brits eventually pulled out and said, we can't solve the problem. They, it's just too messy. And so they turned the problem over to the UN 
And it's this UN uh, partition plan in 1948 that then sets up the establishment of the State of Israel and uh, the Arab-Israeli War. So the State of Israel is established. The West Bank, which remembers the kidney bean, is now under Jordanian control, and Gaza is under Egyptian control. So the only area that Israel, when they establish the state, is that tan area in that map that we had a little while ago. So the West Bank wasn't part of this conflict, and neither was Gaza. There were borders and lines. In fact, the whole city of Jerusalem was cut in half, East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, uh, because of uh, this war. In 19, we, we're jumping over a lot of history. There's a lot of stuff that happens, but again, if you want more details, there's a lot to be, you can listen to one of my lectures on this. But in 1967, this is the big date, Israel gains the West Bank and eventually Gaza and places it under military occupation. This is what many of us would know as the Six Day War. And at this moment, uh, the West Bank, Gaza become under military occupation, which means Israel has military control of these areas and the people that live within them. And so that means Jordan lost control of the West Bank and Egypt lost control of Gaza. And since 1967, those still laws are still in place, although a lot has happened since 1967. So here's a map again of after the, 1960, uh, the 1948 borders. Th this red part here is all, of, um, is all of what becomes the state of Israel. This again becomes to Jordan, Gaza, and this part of the Negev goes to Egypt. Um, but since, in, since 1967, escalation has happened on both sides, um, without a doubt. There's been intifadas. There's been two major intifadas, which are uprisings from the Palestinians against the Israelis. The Israelis have built security walls. There has been incredible under military occupation, limited freedoms for the Palestinians. By, U, by international law and under the UN principles, military occupation is only supposed to be temporary. And you can see that they've been militarily occupied since 1967. And also part of the UN charters and there are even rules of engagement are that if you are part of a, an area that's taken over in war, the ordinary everyday people should be able to return to the land that was theirs. That was denied in 1948. And again, it still continues to today. So since 1967, but both sides have escalated on all this. There's been skirmishes with Gaza. There's been uh, uprisings. And um, again, if you want to know more about this, I have an hour and a half long or about three hours on this that you can do from the Palestinian and the Israeli perspective. Another key date is that the Oslo Accords happen. And at that point, this is a, a peace agreement that's signed with Israel and all the major players in the Palestinian realm. It's supposed to be a five-year transition plan. And when you hear the words two-state solution, Oslo was supposed to set the foundation for that. Israel and then a second Palestinian state that would be governed by the Palestinian Authority, which was established in the 1993 Oslo Accords. But that um, some aspects of the Oslo Accords are in place, but there certainly has not been granted statehood and the transfer of land and power um, from the Israelis to the Palestinians has not happened. Oh, there's my, there we go. And so um, this is just from the 1967 war. Israel actually occupies part of this place of Syria. They take over ownership of the whole Sea of Galilee. And you can, they actually take over more in the Sinai, but which eventually gets returned. So just to get some demographics, there's 9.7 million people in Israel. There's 3.6 million people in the West Bank. And there's about 2.2, maybe 2.1 now, of people that are in Gaza. So part of what you need to know about these demographics is when we talk about two state or one state solutions, it has to do with can the Jewish uh, maintain the majority in this area. So there's seven, over 7 million Jews, 73% of the population in Israel is, are Jews, but 21% are Arabs and they are called Arab Israelis. Most of the time when you listen to the news and they're talking about Israeli and Israelis, they're meaning the Jewish Israelis. But for the sake of this, uh, talk, I'm going to distinguish and call them Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis. And so 
of Israel, these Arabs have full citizenship rights, even though there are, again, this could be another two hour lecture on the, they are really treated as second class citizens, but they do have the right to vote. In the West Bank, there are about 3 million Arabs, but about um, 600 to 700,000 Jewish settlers live in the West Bank, which is against international law. So the West Bank isn't 100% um, Arab, nor is Israel 100% Jewish. But in Gaza, 2.2 million people, those are all Arabs. There are no Jewish people living legally in Gaza. And there used to be settlers in Gaza, but they were removed years ago, which is part of what this whole mess is all about. So just demographics, just to get a lay of the land, how many people we're talking about, um, that's kind of where that is. So, okay. I have two screens going. So, oh, okay. So, oh, so this is what I want to make sure we know. I'm telling my narrative. I do not have the perspective of a historian. Um, historians are objective. They're outside of the story. They have distance, and they're trying to tell the facts, and they're not a protagonist in the story. But narrative is where we're telling a story that you tell about your own experience or a group tells about its experience. So I'm not going to tell you in the rest of this whole conversation. I'm going to tell you my impressions, which are is more narrative than history. There's facts that go along with that, but I'm interpreting what I've seen, which means I'm giving my narrative of what my experience was when I was there for the last 10 days. Narrative is always subjective. We're talking about group narrative. There's an identity and meaning that's given. A narrative always defines heroes and villains, and the stakeholder, the person telling that, telling it, telling the story, is the protagonist. So in just a minute, we're going to talk about the Jewish-Israeli um, narrative, what their perspective is. They have a group identity and a way of seeing the facts and the history from a particular point of view. If you were to ask uh, Gazans what their story is, they would interpret the same facts quite differently because they're interpreting it through the lens of their experience, their identity, who they are predisposed to see are the heroes and the villains, and just as Israel was. So I just want to be clear that what we're talking about today is not history. It doesn't mean it, there's not facts underneath it, but it means that it's, the facts are being interpreted from a particular point of view. Um, before I ask you guys, let me just stop sharing. I just want to ask, does anybody have any questions about that concept of narrative or any questions about the history, that very brief understanding of history that I just said? Anybody? I don't see any hands being raised. So what I'm going to ask you now, though, and you guys need to unmute yourselves before you talk, is just from what you've read about from the news, what do you think the Jewish Israelis are feeling about this Hamas-Israeli war? What would you guess? What would you think they're saying? Or feeling? Or believing? Yeah, go I, ahead, Ruth. Well, I was going to say, I've, I've heard conflicting things and read conflicting things. Um, I mean, just recently I read an op-ed piece by the father of one of the hostages, um, who is a professor I forget at Hebrew University or one of anyway, and he was actually rather sympathetic of what the Palestinians are going through, which was mm -hmm. really interesting, um, mm -hmm. and very much against how Netanyahu is dealing with all of this. So you you sort of get some of that perspective, and and he was saying it's it's not necessarily anti-Semitic because you disagree with what the government policies are. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I mean, I think there's, you know, you also get the sense that there is so much grief and um, there's been so much trauma that it's just, it's, you know, it's just a horrible feeling for, for the Israelis who are going through this, seeing what was done to, you know, when you hear about the brutal, um, you know, sexual violence and so forth that took place. Um, so you hear about that too. It's, I mean, you you hear both sides, I think. There's a lot of emotions that cross the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing fear, grief. There's also, it's not unified. 
is what I'm hearing Ruth say. Is there other comments that you guys would make? Or what do you, what would you imagine if you were an Israeli, you might be feeling as a collective whole? I'm interested in what Amy might say. Amy's actually spent a ton of time living in Israel mm -hmm. in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, I think they a lot of them feel threatened and vulnerable. Um, and they also now don't trust that the idea for the army is going to come and save them when they're in a vulnerable situation. Um, they feel like that this is the one place that they thought they could be safe was this homeland. And now that's not um, that's not how they feel anymore. So a lot of trauma. Susan, you had your hand up. Um, my analogy is a, a kind of combining two things. One is the Vietnam War, when we had such an active group that was against the war. Mm -hmm. who did that, that you can see that internally now in Israel, mm -hmm. that there are many who are like, no. And the other thing is, is, and this is personal, my narrative or my thing is, I find Netanyahu, I can't believe what he's doing. I can't believe that they're going to let 2 million Palestinians starve to death. Th that to me is so horrific and to me, someone who justifies their homeland as being a safe place, carving out a piece of it and saying, you're not going to be safe here. We're going to starve you. And yet they don't see the analogy to how they were treated during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. so let's and and so I feel strongly both ways. <laughs> if, that's, if you can do that, I feel strongly both ways. Yeah, so we, we talked just a little bit, but let's. this is what I observed from when I was there, uh, that they feel that strongly that they have the right to defend themselves. Even with the criticism of Netanyahu, most Israelis are are for the right to defend themselves and are not, are pretty, well, first of all, they don't have the same news that we have of what's going on in Gaza. The news has been uh, fairly censored until about the last two months. So the depth of the um, what's happening in Gaza, they don't really have in their regular news. It, I think Amy was absolutely right. It shattered their sense of security. There had always been a feeling that of invincibility, especially after the Six-Day War and after their uh, war with um, Lebanon earlier. And this made them feel very vulnerable, very, just incredibly vulnerable. It's also increased a distrust of the Palestinians. Um, and that includes Arabs, in, in, Arab Israelis. So Arab Israelis were arrested in the early part of October, November, and even as late as May for expressing any kind of support or, or criticism of the war in Gaza. And so if you put on your Facebook page anything that suggested, um, like, if you were an Arab and you said, you know, may Allah bless, uh, uh, you know, may Allah intervene. That could have been perceived as being um, pro-Gaza uh, or pro-Palestinian, and, and Arabs have been arrested. So there's, anyway, so they don't trust the Palestinians. They immediately, they shut down the West Bank, which means that any of the workers, the day workers that used to go into Israel, including day workers from Gaza that used to work in Israel, but the West Bank in particular was shut down um, economically and physically. Uh, there was, uh, there's now been, there's a few checkpoints that are open, but Palestinians that live in the West Bank do not have the right to go into Israel anymore. And then again, I talked about administrative detention, and many, many Palestinians have been um, in Israel and in, especially in the West Bank, have been arrested. And the feeling of the Jewish press more recently is to retaliate against anyone who's against us. So Ruth mentioned anti-Semitism. Part of this is that anybody who uh, expresses criticism of the government, um, especially outside of Israel, uh, is seen as being, is accused of being anti-Semitic. And in fact, there are activists within Israel that have criticized the government in the case of the war and have been accused of anti-Semitism. So it's been a, it's very, very highly charged in that respect. Emotionally, you have to remember that the, the Jewish people have big fears of annihilation after the Holocaust. And this um, 
this was the largest loss of Jewish life in one incident since the Holocaust. And so there's tremendous fear of annihilation and their rallying cry of never again. They have really deep paranoia. Everyone's out to get us, and it's sort of like we're going to stand our ground and we don't trust anyone. There's a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety, especially if you live in the north where the, um, the rockets from Hezbollah are coming into the north, are also if you live around um, Gaza. There are still, they don't really even talk about it, but there are still rockets being sent from Gaza into Israel. They're usually wiped out by their Iron Dome um, security system. But if you live in Ashdod or um, Ashkelon right there, not too far from the border, there's a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety. What's really shifted is that within the peace movement, uh, Jewish and Palestinian people that have been working together to try and be for peace, many activists in the peace movement, not everybody, but many have, this has been a breach that they haven't been able to get over. There's been tremendous disappointment within Israel, uh, Jewish Israelis, that Palestinian government and even Palestinians that were in the peace movement did not say enough to condemn uh, Hamas's action on October 7th. And so there's been tremendous fractures within the peace movement. Some of that is now they're trying to build this back, but there was just a void and a, a chasm um, between the two people because of how differently the Jewish Israelis experienced and interpret October 7th and how many Palestinians interpret and experience October 7th. And, and this is true of both the Palestinians and the Israelis, um, Jewish Israelis, Arab Israelis, West Bank, um, Palestinians or Gazans. What happens to one happens to us all. Uh, the Jewish society there is a very collectivist society. So every hostage, even if it's not your family, feels like it's, it's part of your extended Jewish family. And the same is true uh, with the Palestinians. What happens in Gaza when families are killed or people are killed, they feel it as if it happened to them. So this is really pretty much what I observed in Israel. I will say that I didn't get to spend as much time in Israel talking to Jewish people, but this is pretty clear how the feeling was of all of that. Their response was to bombard Gaza. Their uh, they don't really care about civilians all that much. The objective, uh, the objective of wiping out Hamas is more important than civilian lives. They also work very hard to control and limit the narrative, even within, um, even within Israel. Even the most left-leaning uh, papers like Haaretz do not talk a lot. They talk in a limited way, not like our news does, about what's happening in Gaza. Uh, there's not been a lot of um, what do I want to say? There's not a lot of news reports about, for example, about the extensive hunger that's going on and the lack of water or the, um, they'll talk about the hospitals, but they don't really talk about the consequences of that, that the hospital, that there's really no um, medical, uh, medical infrastructure left, not a, a one that can handle the amount of uh, uh, casualties and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So they've also spent, and this, this narrative is also to the point that they have, um, like for example, Al Jazeera, which has a more pro-Arab bent. All, I mean, all news has its own um, thing. They, for example, kicked all the Al Jazeera um, reporters out of Israel proper. They would still report from Gaza, but they have no um, reporting rights in Israel anymore. And there's also been, um, um, on both sides, there's been misinformation, but Israel has done this too. Some of the pictures or some of the accusations that have happened have not been established by um, third independent party type people. So there, you'll hear this. In Israel, like what Ruth mentioned, the sexual violence against some of the hostages or what happened at on October 7th, and then you will hear Palestinians who will say that's absolutely wrong. So um, they all are trying to, to limit and tell stories of horror that no one's ever been able to validate on either side. It's very difficult to get to the real, um, the real truth on all of this. But again, to their narrative, they're controlling and limiting the narrative so that it, it's, um, they have the most moral army in the world. They're doing only what's necessary to um, 
control Hamas. They've also increased the settlement. There's been um, within the, the very right-wing government in um, Israel. So they uh, increased the number of settlements, which means Jewish Israelis living in that occupied territory of the West Bank. And one of the great uh, tales that they love to say is the river to the sea. Um, while it's illegal, the Palestinian protesters in the United States say that, I never heard, I've never heard anybody say that any Palestinians say that in, in Israel or in the West Bank, but this is a saying of the Israeli government that all of Israel, including the West Bank, should all belong to Israel and uh, with an indication of wanting to uh, eliminate the Palestinian population. That's not everybody. That's just some very radical people. They've tried to discredit the Palestinian Authority. And then one of the, wonder, one of the crazy things they're doing is they're arming everyday citizens. So these same settlers that are living in the West Bank have all been um, commissioned as civilian armies. And so they have the ability to use force against Palestinians without uh, any kind of due process of law. But so do everyday um, Israelis are armed. So this is a picture in the middle is Ben Gavir. He's one of the members of the cabinet. This, they've been bragging about how many guns they've been able to give to everyday Israelis. And this is not an unusual uh, theme to see. This is a guy carrying a gun with his son. He's got a little balloon tied behind it. You see everyday Israelis on the street with um, machine guns. And um, this is just the way it is. So everyday citizens are walking around with automatic um, machine guns. I should say the people that have been armed, however, are only Jewish Israelis. Arab Israelis are not given um, the ability to have uh, automatic weapons like this or been part of this gun distribution program including Arab villages that are on the northern border with uh, Lebanon. And so while you may be in an Arab village and there may be two um, Israeli villages on either side of you, those two cities have been distributing guns and automatic weapons to citizens, but not to the Arab um, citizens that are there. And you, can, and you can imagine why. The distrust of the Palestinians or the Arabs by the Israelis there is always an uneasy distrust of Arabs and, that are part of Israeli society, and this has just amplified it. Uh, let me go back. Okay, so this is a recent Jewish-Israeli opinion poll, and there's an increasing number who view uh, well over the majority that agree that or believe that Israelis view Arabs as dirty, primitive, and that, that Arabs do not value human life that Israelis also see um, violence as an integral part of Arab culture, that they are supportive of more separation between Arabs and Jewish people and Arab society, and that Israeli, Jewish Israelis have no common future with Arabs. So the society's opinions of Arabs is growing increasingly hostile with more decision to want to separate them or um, not have interaction with them. So that's a little bit about that. Now I want to ask you guys, how do you think the Arab Israelis feel? <laughs> so I'm not talking about the Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza. I'm just talking about Arab citizens of Israel. What do, how do you think they are feeling about this war? Where do you think their conflicts are, what they might be feeling about all of this? Any ideas? I think for one, I would say that they probably feel like they're stuck in the middle. You're right. They do feel stuck in the middle, Terry. Good insight. Anybody else? I would think they feel frightened. Frightened? Because they're not wanted where they live. Mm -hmm. They're not wanted for where they live. I would... Don't... Go ahead, Pam. I would think that they also are wondering if they know about it, all the support that the U.S. has given them. Um, they're uh, not in Yahoo! That... They might not like that. We've had a lot of protests um, supporting the Palestinians here in the U.S. and on the campuses. So I'm just wondering how both sides feel about that. And I'm wondering what direction this is going to go and how it might impact our election. Good insight. I wish I knew the answer to that. I can tell you, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we get to um, some of the Palestinians. You may be surprised at what some of um, the West Bank Palestinians who I talked to the most about this thought about our political situation. 
So, um, uh, okay. So the Arab-Israeli perspective, again, remember, these are the 21% of the population that are Israeli citizens. They feel very much a pressure to be good Arabs. In other words, they're, they're living under a fear that if they really said what they thought or believed or show any kind of criticism to the Israeli government or any criticism of the war, that they'll be silenced and they have a fear of arrest. And so all the Arab Israelis that I spoke to talk about being needing to be exemplary in all of their public facing activities um, and including their social media. They feel a general and they feel a general distrust of the Israeli government and a, a political distrust of the system, whether they will be uh, respected or even remembered when all of this happens. They do not feel defended when there has been um, violence against Arab Israelis. Um, and what everything that they probably felt or had in some of their experience before the war has only amplified. They are very afraid. I had several um, Arab Israeli men tell me how unsettling it was to go to a grocery store to see um, Jewish Israelis armed and realize that if they acted in a way that was interpreted as aggressive or not being um, as good Arabs as they could be, that they said they were afraid that a Jewish Israeli could turn a gun on them, a machine gun on them, without any due process, and they, they would never have any recourse. They could be killed. What was interesting to me about that, I'll, I'll, for those of you who know Mohammed, mm -hmm. I was talking to, he's a, a bus driver or a, a taxi driver that drives us around on our group. But um, Mohammed, I was talking to him about his kids were out of school, and I asked whether or not uh, what he was going to do with his kids during the summer. Um, his wife is working, and as a taxi driver, he said, Jewish Israelis will not enter into his taxi anymore. And to give you another idea about Mohammed, just while I'm talking about him, he was embedded with a CNN crew for about six weeks between October 7th and the mid part of um, October. And he said to me, you'll notice that I never posted one picture on Facebook about what I saw of the destruction in Gaza because I was afraid I would be arrested. Hmm. So when I was talking to him about the summer, what he was going to do, and I said, why don't you take your kids to the beach in Tel Aviv? And he said, I can't take my kids to the beach. They're too young. They don't know Hebrew yet. He said, if we are overheard speaking Arabic in Tel Aviv, especially on the beach, he said, I think something, uh, we could be victims of violence, and I won't put my children under that. Hmm. And if you know Muhammad, he's a pretty um, bold guy. I was really su surprised to see him uh, so concerned because he's kind of thumbed his nose at the Israelis at varying times. Mohammed happens to live in Jerusalem and as, is an Arab Israeli. They have anticipated their feelings as, as second class citizens. They were not given the same respect or are able to be armed, for example. But you said it when somebody said they're caught in America, Terry said this they are Israeli citizens. And as Israeli citizens, they actually feel the threat of what Hamas did to Israel. It is still their country. And especially for the younger generation, they have a certain pride in being Israeli citizens, even though they are, are second-class citizens. But they also have empathy for the people in Gaza and the plight of the uh, Palestinians, and they feel very caught between their country of citizenship and many of the achievements within Israeli society. And then also feeling deep sadness and empathy for the plight of the Palestinians, especially what's going on in Gaza. And they don't have really, uh, except in their homes privately, have any forum to be able to talk about this. There's no public forum. There's no public gatherings that they can talk about the war, because if they were, they would be uh, perceived as being um, pro-Palestinian and to be arrested. And then there's also this issue of guilt that they see their tax dollars are funding the war. And so uh, while in the northern part of the country, many of the Arab Israelis do not have direct connections to Gaza, but again, they still have a Palestinian identity. And as I said before, what happens to one happens to them all. And so there's a tremendous amount of guilt that their um, economic viability or whatever um, is funding 
uh, the war against people that they care about and love, even if they aren't particular or aren't direct family members. All right, Dr. Choji Mohammed. So, how do you, this is a big one. How do you think the Palestinians in Gaza, sorry, I gotta take off my, I thought it's, it's the Velcro of my boot. I gotta take it off, it's hurting right now. How do you think the Palestinians in Gaza feel about what's going on? That's probably pretty easy, what do you think? You can almost imagine. What do you think? Come on, somebody has to have thought well, about I, what on earth that the Palestinians are experiencing in Gaza and how they would feel about it. I have actually, um, the only friend that I knew when I first moved here 10 years ago, um, her best friend is married to a Palestinian and that friend of mine is Jewish. So whenever the two friends meet, they're, they can conflict immediately, just like they can't be in the same room at once with each other. Um, I don't understand it because it's been obviously something I haven't personally undergone, but there just so much of this seems to be really close to home. If you look at the history of the U.S. and some of the things that we're going through now, the hateful ways, the, um, the genocide discussions for some hate groups. And I mean, if you do some looking at Southern Poverty Law Center, they do, have done studies and research on this stuff. So I don't wanna get off the subject, but it's to me, it's right on the subject. It's, this is a lot about the haves and the have nots. So what do you think, Terry, or anybody else, I'm gonna mute yourself. What do you think a Gazan has been experiencing or feeling about this war? I think they're like traumatized, terrorized, starving, um, frustrated that with probably with the leadership, um, distrustful of their, you know, of Hamas as well as Israelis. I saw one article that was a reporter who had been everywhere in the world and like all the worst situations. And she said she's never seen anything like this. And the people were walking around just looking like zombies. Like they were just past being able to respond almost. It was, they were that traumatized. So yeah. helpless. Yeah, Ruth, you were gonna say something, I think. Did I hear you? Well, yeah. I, I was just saying that they, I would, I mean, if I were there, I think I would feel just totally terrorized. I, it's like, where, where do you live? Where can you be safe? Where where are you going to get food for your children? I mean, I just, I cannot imagine the amount of fear and anxiety and trauma that you're going through. Rick, I see that your hand's up. Please. Uh, yes, Debbie, I was going to say basically the same thing. If I were there, I'd be too afraid even to go, just go outside. I'd be so traumatized. Yeah, so I think we're all in green. Trauma, fear, terror, um, helplessness, hopelessness, fear, anxiety. When you think about the fact that Gaza is about the size of Washington, D.C., and you double it, or just a little bit bigger than the city of the size of the, the uh, geography of Chicago, or if you took Gaza and put it in San Francisco, it's about the same square miles. San Francisco, it's a little bit smaller. And so when you think about that, and you think about relentless bombing for um, eight months now, and think about um, what it would be to be a child to experience over and over again that kind of, kind of relentless uh, trauma. Um, for those here in Cincinnati, if you, if you want to gain a perspective on more, talk to Stephen Bruning sometime about what it was like for him to be a street kid uh, in Vietnam. As you, many of you know, he was uh, he was airlifted out at an age they think he was two. They don't know if he was two or three years old, and the lifetime trauma that he's experienced from being a child as a victim of war. And Stephen's very willing to talk about it, but you imagine the um, the cost to the children. So let's just talk. And I have to say, this is now this is more speculative on my part. I didn't I didn't go to Gaza. I'm not allowed to Gaza. I didn't want to go to Gaza. I promised my church I wouldn't go to Gaza. I promised my children I didn't go to Gaza, but this is what I was hearing from people who know people in Gaza. 
of what they are sort of facing and feeling. And of course, they're feeling deep fear and anxiety. The UN is, re um, I guess I don't know how to spell the word depression. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, th this levels of depression are what I think, was it Amy who just said they're walking around like zombies, right? There's, there's no emotional life left. It's like been drained from them. There's also compounding grief because um, what's different about Arab society is that families tend to live in units. So when they would bomb these apartment buildings or, or even these tent cities, the families all gather together. So that when they're talking about 20 or 30 or 60 people from a family being wiped out, the reason that happens is because the families all live on multiple floors in a building or would it be gathered together in a, in a tent city where many of them are living now. And so families just didn't lose their brother or their sister or their mother or their father. They lost aunts and uncles and the whole support system, which is critical to um, Palestinian society. And one of the interesting things for me is that there is not a strong um, adoption culture in Arab society. And, and as a result, when, if a child is orphaned because their parents were um, killed or hurt or, or something like that, the family in Palestinian society would scoop those children up or those family members up. And because the child doesn't just belong to the immediate family like in our system, they belong to the whole family. And But when you have all the aunts and uncles and fathers and mothers and grandparents and cousins across the spectrum have been killed, it means many of these children who are orphaned, their futures are really uncertain. And there isn't a culture of adoption in Palestinian society. So it's really unclear what will happen to all of these children who are at great risk. The society itself will probably gather them in, but you're talking about a completely traumatized uh, society who's dealing with their own loss. So the grief and the trauma is compounding. Um, as you, of course, as we all know, many of the Palestinians have been displaced, um, not once, but twice, three, four times, um, and often have been uh, displaced to places that were supposed to be safe zones that then turned out not to be. So it's extremely, um, it's, an, it's just chaotic beyond what you can imagine. The hunger and famine is uh, rampant. Dehydration and disease, 67%, uh, nearly oh, two thirds of their water and sewage program or infrastructure has been destroyed. And if you had followed um, Gaza before, they did not have already have a good water and sewage infrastructure before the war. So um, I read, this made me so upset. I read this today that it said that a, a person might get one bottle of water and one can of food to last a week in certain parts of Gaza right now. Imagine one bottle of water and one can of food because the aid is not coming in. And the, if you want to really be depressed, you can look up uh, starvation in Gaza and to see the children who are, are um, dying because of starvation and of dehydration. Of course, we've all read or heard about the limitations on aid deliveries. The medical uh, infrastructure has been decimated. They've not only destroyed homes, but also farmland. So the food that they cannot even produce, the food that they used to uh, produce to feed their own people, the farmlands have been um, destroyed. Businesses, schools, it's, it's just um, something that I read. It was 80%, I think, of the homes and businesses have been destroyed in uh, Gaza. And... Uh, you guys know the rest. So you, I, well, this is not from me. Uh, I didn't, I didn't talk to a, somebody who's been in the war. This was talking to people in the West Bank, red family members, as well as just doing reading and stuff like that. But I didn't want to leave Gaza out of this topic. So this is where I spent the most of my time. As you all know, I broke my leg or my ankle the first day I was there when I was up in Nazareth. Um, and I spent most of the time in the West Bank. In fact, I spent most of the time in one house in the West Bank because I couldn't move. I couldn't leave. I couldn't walk. But I got an earful from all the um, 20, 30, 40 people who came in. Probably, I probably had about 50 visitors, to be honest, that came and visited me, and I talked to everybody about this. So how do you think the people in the West Bank are feeling about this? Remember, we have Israelis, 
that are Jewish, Israelis that are Arabs. We have the Gazans. And the West Bank are the people in the kidney bean. And as I mentioned to you, that the West Bank was closed down um, right at the war. The borders were closed. All the um, work permits were canceled. Um, so while they, and they have had settler violence going on, but it has not made the news in the same way, of course, like Gaza, understandably. But from what you know or what you think, anybody have any ideas of how the West Bank Palestinians are feeling? Anybody got any ideas on that one? And I know some of you actually talked to some of those West Bank Palestinians. I'm hoping Sandra will jump into this conversation. Maybe Amy will, or others of you that have regular correspondence. I think, I think they must, I know they are extremely angry. They were already angry at just the way um, the, the West Bank has been um, deprived of so, so much anyway, uh, through all these years. Water, we can go on and on. But um, I imagine they, I'm sure they are extremely angry with the Israeli government, uh, increased anger at the settlers, but I imagine they're also angry at Hamas leadership. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Sandra, you've talked to people in the West Bank. Or I think you have. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Um, between rage and despair, I mean, not that anyone has said that to me, but that's what I would be feeling, rage and despair. And um, I'm wondering how the Christians are doing. How, how are they finding hope in Jesus? That, that's a question that I have. Okay. I'll, I'll can talk about that in a little bit. Anybody else have any speculation of how you think? Yeah, Amy. I've talked to a friend who has three little children. He lives in Janine, and he's just been terrified for their safety um, this whole time. I mean, there's been raids and stuff really close to where he lives. Um, and yeah, just just sadness for the future of his children and also just fear. Um, yeah. And then a lot of depression um, from friends that are in Jerusalem that are Palestinian um, and just people not leaving their homes because they don't feel like it's safe, um, just that their lives are completely shut down and they're just kind of afraid all the time. Mm -hmm. Rick, I think you have your hand up again. Please. Uh, yes, Debbie, I just was gonna say in this regard, when you preached at First Pres Berkeley a few weeks ago, I remember you saying that on the Easter Sunday that they had there, that the one thing they had was hope. Mm -hmm. There is, there, I will, I will say for the Christians who I didn't really talk to a lot of uh, Muslim people about this, their faith aspect. There's a feeling that God holds the whole of history, and that they will survive this. Uh, this piece, even if it means it goes beyond their own uh, generation. But they do, um, they have hope in God. They do not have hope in the political situation, is how I would describe it. Um, uh, they, they don't see any, they don't see much of a future with um, the way things are, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more. So let me just tell you a little bit about what they, I experienced from them or heard from them. One, the West Bank feels like they're unjustly persecuted. The borders were closed. The work permits were revoked. There's been high levels of arrest for administrative detention, and there's been an economic blockade. Where Amy was talking about in the northern part of the West Bank, in an area called Janine, there's been daily raids by the IDF. And so ordinary citizens feel quite threatened and concerned. Where I was in near Bethlehem, there weren't those kinds of raids happening. So different places in the West Bank have different experiences, but they all feel like there's, um, they're unjustly persecuted in all of this. The West Bank, does, while they do have people who support Hamas, the government, the government authority is the Palestinian Authority, not Hamas. They did not support, um, do not support Hamas politically, but I will say that there was a, a piece of the West Bank, um, and I would say Gaza felt this too, you may not have appreciated what uh, Hamas did and think it's horrible to take life, which I believe the people I know believe, 
But they also took a certain amount of pride in that the persecuted finally stood up to what they considered their persecutors. That doesn't mm-hmm. mean they wish ill will on Israel and everything like that. It's just it was sort of like the Ewoks in the Star Wars movie. It was like the people who have no power finally stood up to the bully. And there is some of that in the West Bank, especially initially, that right. it was like, wow, finally our perspective is being heard. Right. Not in, not condoning the uh, loss of life, but feeling like somehow finally um, the little guy had a say. But they do feel, the West Bank feels like they were not Gaza. And so these all these restrictions that have happened have completely shut down their um, economy and their freedom of movement, even within the West Bank. It's been really, really difficult. And so there's a, a general, this is what I just want to show you. These are like, um, like in the middle of a street. Israel puts these borders so there's limiting movement. Um, oh, I don't remember which I was. So this is the kind of, um, the borders were closed. There were um, uh, dirt berms that were set up at places. Uh, the house where I stayed for about a month after October 7th, you couldn't get into the village at all um, because of the road closures that uh, Israel imposed. There's tremendous distrust of the Palestinian Authority itself. They don't feel hopeful in that government. And they do not like President Biden at all. And um, in fact, you might be surprised that every single Palestinian I met told me they would vote for Trump if they had the right to vote. They Mm -hmm. absolutely hate Biden, and they like Trump because they said, even if Trump is against us, he at least will say what he believes, and then we'll do it. They said, we prefer the direct talking of Trump to the the um, two-faced commitments that they see on the part of Biden. It was really surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Of course, they have a deep distrust of Israel. What they're very anxious about is for their own survival. There wasn't a person I talked to that isn't hasn't seriously considered leaving the West Bank. Um, they're very fearful for their children. They're wondering if the West Bank will become the next Gaza. Uh, before the war, Gaza was um, blockaded at every border, sea borders and all land borders are controlled by Israel with no uh, freedom of movement. And there's a deep concern within um, West Bank uh, Palestinians that Israel could do the same thing to the West Bank, especially with the presence and the increasing presence of settlers, of whom many of those set settlements are more extreme um, Jewish Israelis. So they're very, very anxious. So before I do that, that's sort of what I'm going to tell you about how I feel about that. But I realized when I talked about this on Sunday, I didn't tell anybody about what my experience was. So I'm going to do that next. But do you guys have any questions for me on these four perspectives, Jewish Israeli, Arab Israeli, Gaza perspectives or the West Bank before I kind of tell you, if I only heard this presentation, I've probably been very scared for my safety, but that's not all that happened. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Anybody have any questions or comments they want to make? Yeah, Ruth. So if like, let's say Elias and his family or Iyad or whatever said, okay, this feels too unsafe for our family. Where would they possibly go that would would feel that would take them and where they would feel safe. Um, America is always a big hope for many of the West Bank Palestinians, um, even though they don't, they they think are we're so all the guns in the America scare them to death. They don't like all the liberal culture and all that stuff. But many of them would feel like they have that. There's talk of going to Cyprus that they could. Um, in fact, Elias bought a house in um, Cyprus recently. Uh, bought an apartment, uh, they're all trying to, because what Ruth is asking about are all the people that those who have been on pilgrimages know, Yad or Elias and Isa, who run the um, tour agency, Yad was one of our guides. Um, that man who's on this call would have gone with Rami, was a different guide. They, um, none of them have been able to work, but all the tour guide permits have been revoked, so Yad hasn't worked for eight months. Um, Elias and Isa, they all went into different businesses. That's why they're selling olive wood right now. Um, but they all don't know whether the border will open up again. They believe it will. They think they've lived through enough of these cycles that they think it will. But they're terrified for their children. So um, basically, they would want to leave and they'd go anywhere that would take them. 
it, they've already, the Christian population, the Christian population in the West Bank, um, even Arab Israelis, tends to be much higher, more highly educated than the Muslim population. The Christian population really invests in upper um, uh, postgraduate education and things like that. But all of them are frightened for their children. All of them are. Debbie, so. um, in terms of whether or not the border will be open again for them to work, um, is it not a possibility that um, is Israel uh, proper will start realizing that they need those Palestinian workers to be able to come back in and work? Um, because like um, uh, US citizens, US people realize uh, immigrants do work here that um, uh, that regular U.S. people don't want to do. Um, so is that a, is that the case in Israel where they really need the Palestinian workers that are usually uh, much lower paid, or or they may need um, I don't know if Palestinian doctors, the higher educated one, if they need them there, is that um, a potentiality? I don't hear people talking about that, um, be partly because the government under Netanyahu right now is a very right-wing coalition. If they are able to call, if the coalition breaks apart, if somebody leaves the coalition, Netanyahu loses his majority and they will have to call for a general election. When that happens, most people believe Netanyahu will be voted out of power. But that coalition that's so right-wing is um, has no empathy for the Palestinians and doesn't care. They would, they're the ones who want the river to the sea to be completely Jewish with no Palestinian presence. It wouldn't surprise me, to be really honest, if you wouldn't see the, if this right-wing government said they would incentivize people to leave. They would love nothing more than 3 million Palestinians to leave the West Bank. So I, I don't know what they're going to do. The, the thing that happens in this if you've studied anything about what the conflict in Israel, is that every time there's been an uprising of any kind from the Palestinians, including like now this Gaza war, Israel clamps down harder than they did the time before. And then while they may ease up some of that tension, it's never back to where it was before. So for example, when you have an intifada, there was raids and there was curfews and all this kind of stuff. Then the next time there was an intifada, an uprising, that's when they started building the, the security wall. So the security and the restrictions get more and more tight compared to what they were 20 years ago. So I, I don't know to Charlotte's question. I don't think anybody knows. But right now, the Israeli government shows no, uh, there's not a whole lot of movement in the Israeli um, coalition government that's in power right now displays any empathy towards the Palestinians. So I don't know what's going to happen. So now I'm just going to tell you because I really, my goal in my whole life has been to humanize the, uh, how would I do, to humanize the, uh, the Palestinian story because I uh, believe so deeply in their humanity. So I just want to tell you a little bit about what my trip was like, just so especially people from my own church don't think I was crazy. I spent my time with Elias and Lena at their home in an area called Beit Zahor. It's, a, it's the village right next to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And this Beit Zahor is the traditional area where the shepherds receive the angelic notification. And Elias owns the tour agency that I work for. I've known them for, I don't know, 14 years probably. And they are like family to me. And they were absolutely wonderful. So as all of you know, um, this is their family. This is George. Uh, Sarah's on the right. She's uh, 14, George is 12, and Cece is 10. So these are their kids that I spent a ton of time with who are just amazing. But on the first day that I was there, I broke my ankle in Nazareth. I was in the, I was visiting um, Azar and Ibtisam Ajaj. Uh, Azar spoke at um, Mount Washington Presbyterian Church, for some of you who know him. He's the president of Nazareth Evangelical Seminary, and Ibtisam is my Arabic teacher. And so I was visiting them in their fifth story apartment where there's no elevator and I fell on the fifth floor and uh, seriously broke my angel. And so that meant I drove home to the West Bank going through all sorts of things like uh, uh, checkpoints and things like that. Um, but I was then wheelchair bound for the, uh, until I got home actually in Ohio. 
I was not allowed to put any weight on my ankle because of the type of break I have. This is an example of the challenges that I face. This is a checkpoint at, in Bethlehem. This is a new thing. You'll see if you notice down by where the cars are on the ground, instead of speed humps, they have speed divots, which mean that cars can't go through here fast. It slows the whole um, process down. What that means is when I drove my rental car through this checkpoint, just to remind you, because I have an American passport, I have what's called a yellow, uh, this yellow uh, license plate. Palestinians are never allowed to drive through this checkpoint, um, West Bank Palestinians. West Bank Palestinians cannot drive a car in Israel. So you go through this checkpoint, you're um, questioned, and your trunk is searched, your, all your items are searched so that you can enter into um, Israel. The other thing that the challenges have is that these temporary gates were set up all over the place, blocking main arteries and roads, which meant for me, one of these, this gate that's being closed here meant that I added 30 minutes onto my trip up to um, Nazareth because they closed this gate, which was really close to where I was staying, and I had to go through town and all a bunch of different ways to do. But these are some of the barriers and blockades that they have within the West Bank. And the West Bank people, there's no notification about this. These um, roadways are blocked on a regular basis. Here's an example of the um, dirt that they, or rock that they put in the middle of a road blocking access to a particular village. Um, and this has all been ramped up since October 7th. This was interesting for me for the first time. Uh, I've been in the West Bank a bazillion times. This was using Waze. As soon as I entered into the, um, to the West Bank, these warnings began to show up on my phone. Dial this thing, high risk area, rerouting. This is a, when I plugged in a place where I wanted to go, Warning, don't go there. I've never, ever, ever had these kinds of warnings show up on my phone um, as a way. And, and I want to just encourage you to tell you I was in a very peaceful area. I didn't hear um, planes overhead. I, there was no bombs that I ever listened or heard. There was um, no, there wasn't a lot of IDF presence at all in the village or in the area where I was in the West Bank. So these were really alarming type of um, uh, notifications that came up on the phone, and this is used by um, often by Israel to discourage people from going into the West Bank, people like me who have the ability. Here's my boarding pass. This is quite interesting. I was in the West Bank. I was flying home on an Israeli airline called El Al. Um, I had booked my ticket through Delta, so I didn't realize they had changed my ticket to this Israeli airline. But when I was in the West Bank, I could not, I could not um, confirm my flight because the internet um, IP address in the West Bank would not allow me to even get on Israeli sites while I was there. So I couldn't check into my flight. In fact, the worst part was that I couldn't request wheelchair assistance because I had no access to their, um, to their uh, website or to their app. It wouldn't download and it wouldn't open up because I was in the West Bank. So these are some of the challenges that I experienced, but that everyday Palestinians experience. So, in fact, most of the um, Palestinians I know that are in business have two separate IP addresses on their phone. So they can call out, they have to have two separate numbers, a number that originates in the West Bank when they're calling locally, and then they have to have a separate phone number and a different, like, I don't know how the technology works, but it's a fake IP address in Israel so that they can do business in Israel because um, internet traffic is blocked. Um, that was an interesting challenge I had. But I also had a lot of fun. If you followed me on Facebook, you can just see this is just as a sampling of the food that I had, um, many of which I got to help make and do. The fresh fruit was incredible. Um, they, this is homemade bread made on charcoal coals that the women made one night for me. This is mamul, these cookies. This is homemade shawarma. I mean, we made grape leaves. We stuffed all sorts of stuff. So you can just see I, had, I didn't suffer for lack of food. Um, and they, in fact, this is my new deal. But when I, during a group to the West Bank or to uh, uh, on a pilgrimage, I'm going to offer a two-day or three-day food extension. So if you want to learn how to cook traditional Palestinian food, you can enjoy it. It's, it was really quite something. I, I was very well cared for. Here are just some of the people I met, some of whom that you will know. This is Issa Elias's brother. He owns a tour agency. This is his son, the, the bottom left. Rami's and his soon-to-be uh, fiance, um, Juicy Ann. This is uh, Nayef and um, 
what's her name? How can I not remember? Naya. Anyway, she's pregnant. She's due about the same time Ashley is. She's one of our people in our church. Um, these are just a sprinkling of the people that I met that came. There's a whole bunch of people that came. Um, for those of you who saw my stool on Sunday, this is one of the, the uh, Palestinian um, uh, textile people that do stuff. And then here's as as Azer and Ibtisam when I was up in their home in Jerusalem. And then for those of you who know Iyad, this is Iyad and his wife, uh, Claudette, who came to visit me. So I had a phenomenal time with, this isn't even all the pictures. There's uh, at least 50 people who came on regularly. But I want to end this time by talking about one last person that I, I has become a friend and is just an amazing woman. Her name is Shireen Awad. She runs the Shepherd Society in Bethlehem. And because of October 7th and the great economic downturn, they started food distribution in the West Bank. Normally this wouldn't happen, it wouldn't be necessary because if a person in the family is suffering or doesn't have enough food, the family would band together and bring food to an elderly person or a family member or a whole family if they were, uh, were having, facing food scarcity of some sort. But after the war and because of the tremendous economic downturn of the borders being closed, they've started a food pantry and also food distribution um, throughout the, the West Bank. It's also created jobs for people in the West Bank. They do the cooking and they do the delivering. But then the Shepherd Society has also been involved in providing medical aid and food supplies to Gaza. Um, if you go to their website, and I'm gonna show it to you in a minute, you can see some of their work where they've had locals uh, distributing food um, in Gaza. They've had several of the containers that have made it into Gaza, and they've also had one or two containers that haven't made it in. So, um, but Shireen is involved in this whole effort. She's just an amazing um, woman. The other thing you need to know about Shireen, though, is that her family is from Gaza. And mm. so early in the war, her grandmother was killed when the Greek Orthodox Church was bombed. Mm. And her uncle also died. Um, she also had another relative who early in the war had um, had the, part of their leg was broken and they had to do surgery without anesthesia um, on Shireen's relatives. So her passion for Gaza and getting stuff into Gaza is quite personal. Shireen is um, part of a family from Gaza. There are only, there are less than a thousand Christians in Gaza. There's only two active churches in Gaza. The church that Shireen is a part of, the Greek Orthodox Church, um, has been around since the fourth century. It's one of the oldest churches in the world. Um, and so Shireen's involvement with Gaza, she talked so tenderly about losing her family members, but also with great anger because it felt so unnecessary that um, there, in fact, the, when the bombing happened at the Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza early in the war, the church had become a center of food distribution and of sanctuary for people. So, um, but Shireen is just an amazing person. And I wanted to let you know if you want to do anything to help, because that's how most of us feel is pretty helpless in all of this. You can send money and donate to the Shepherd Society. It's a good organization. The money all goes out for aid. Shireen is actually employed by the Bethlehem Bible College, so she doesn't take a salary for this work that she does. And um, it's a great organization. It's one that you can trust. And Shireen is the head of it. And you would, um, if, you, if you had the chance just to sit with her, you would um, come to enjoy her and love her well. But just to give you an idea of how depressed everybody is in the West Bank, the night that Shireen came over to visit me, we ended up playing cards out on the patio. Beautiful, beautiful evening in the West Bank. And Shireen woke me the next day and just said, we just laughed and laughed when we were playing cards. And she said, I haven't laughed in months and months. She said it felt so good just to do something sort of silly that sort of was distracting from the war and just to be around good friends. And I was just struck by that's the, the spirit in the West Bank. It's how um, the pall of just being overwhelmed, being depressed, being anxious, being fearful, and how just little teeny moments of grace can make such a difference. So anyway, if you're interested in help, uh, donating money to a group, I think Tony saw this post and she, uh, she was on this call. 
she uh, donated to the Shepherd Society, and I know that Shireen deeply appreciated it. So, as do the Palestinians that uh, receive that. So, before I close this down, is there any questions that you guys have for me? And I haven't. Oh, you, Hope was the one question. I think I sort of just that. Did are there questions you guys have for me? Yeah, Amy. You mentioned the Bethlehem Bible College. I heard that they did do their Christ at the Checkpoint um, conference this year. Like, who who attended? Like, are people coming to Bethlehem? So, Christ at the Checkpoint is a done. It's a sponsored by the um, Bethlehem Bible College, which is the Bible College in the area. The um, they do a, a conference called Christ at the Checkpoint, which is what they're talking about. What's the Christian response? sort of to the occupation. The, the most of the people that came were from Europe, but they had a, they expected like 30 people and they had like two or 300 people that came. So it was yeah. really surprising. I have friends who went, in fact, it was one of my friends who went to the conference that made me so jealous that she was wow. in Bethlehem that that's why I bought my ticket to go because they told me it was safe. So you can get through the border if you have um, a non-Israeli um, passport. So you can get into Bethlehem, but the, all the hotels are closed. The men, most of the restaurants are closed. Um, one day, two people that own one of the bigger hotels in Bethlehem came by and visited and there's just no work, right? So there's, they opened it up for the conference and then they closed it all down. So yeah, people came. They, the tone of the conference, as you might imagine, was extremely angry. It's what I've heard from the people who went. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of frustration with the Christian West, that the sort of evangelical movement in the United States that is so pro-Israel without seeing the humanitarian crisis in, in Gaza is just, it's unthinkable to the Christians in Bethlehem and, and actually Arab Israelis that I met in, um, up in Nazareth who are uh, Christians. They are just, they do not understand how the West cannot see the humani humanitarian crisis. Just yeah, Amy. A question about that. Are they, have they heard like about all the protests and all the support across the U.S. for, for the Palestinians? Are they getting that info? They're encouraged by that, but the protests, as they understand it, are not coming from the Christian community. So their experience is that college students, and so they all, they all know their history, and they all say it sounds like the Vietnam War, right? So they're grateful for the protests. What they're, they're heart sick about is that the Christians, who are their brothers and sisters in Christ, do not um, see their value or their humanity as Palestinians. And I think that is what hurts um, the Christians the most. They, they just feel the pain of, you should, in Christ, we should be more united. They don't even, they don't even care if you agree with them 100%. But they're like, well, you even just listen to us. Will you grant us a voice in this conversation? And there's a deep, um, like, it feels betrayal by the church and by um, Christian brothers and sisters. And I will say, I, so I'm in, the, I'm in the clinic. I'm in the clinic getting my leg x-rayed and getting a cast put on. And the nurse comes in, and she's wearing a hijab. And first of all, I spoke to her in Arabic, which I think totally freaked her out. And I, I said more than hello. And then she asked Lena, she said, where is she from? She didn't ask me. She asked Lena, who was with me. And she said, America. And she said, I didn't think Americans even knew Palestinians or like Palestinians. Why is she even here? And, and then we formed this great bond in, con in con conversing. The, most Palestinians don't think that America, or certainly not American Christians, see their humanity at all or care about them at all. And uh, for those of you who know Adnan, she was from the same village as Adnan, um, where Adnan lived by um, the Herodians. So, but that, those, that surprises me. Like, these are areas that have a lot of tourists, but I, you know, as a nurse in the hospital, maybe she didn't meet a lot of tourists, just clumsy people like me. Anyway. And then just one other, other thing. Go ahead. So I have a friend, Matthew Teller, who's um, a, Jewish British writer and um, he is very good friends with the Palestinians and um, has done all sorts of talks. He got together with Mahmoud, Mahmoud Amuna who runs um, uh, the bookstore in Jerusalem and things and 
um, collaborated with um, writers from Gaza, and they quickly put out this book that's going to be available in October. You can pre-order it. It's called Daybreak in Gaza, mm -hmm. and it's telling about stories, um, stories of Palestinian lives and culture from voices in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So um, I haven't read it, but he's an excellent writer, and he collaborated with that. So um, if you're interested in that, you know, he is a good writer. Amy turned me on to him. He wrote a book about Jerusalem that's excellent. I see, Rick, you got your hand up. Yes, um, Debbie, in one of your Facebook posts, I noticed that you said it was 110 degrees. And I'm wondering, with so little water and so little food, how did you manage to stay hydrated? Well, I, when I was describing little food and little water, that was in Gaza. So the West Bank has food, and the people I stay with are solid in the middle class. Although, as they said, everybody here has a six-month emergency fund. We didn't think you we were going to have to have a 12-month emergency fund to be able to make it. So um, the heat is very dry there. And so inside, it's all stone buildings. So it stayed cool during the day. And then about um, maybe about 8 o'clock at night, you would go out and it would just be beautiful. We had almost all of our dinners outside, um, out on the, the decks and on the patio. Um, and in classic Palestinian form, we would set the table, have one church-sized six-foot table to maybe feed eight people. And then more people would come. So you'd add another six-foot table and another six-foot table. They never, ever cooked a meal that involved guests, which was every lunch and about half of the dinners that they weren't cooking for about uh, 20 people, 20 uh, to 25 adults. It's just part of their culture. So you'd roll out and you'd sit out and they, you just talk, talk and share and make jokes. And um, food is a big part of their hope and their culture. It's the thing that brings them all together. So, you know, that's what I worry about. If all these people immigrate to various parts of the world, if they don't immigrate as families, it undermines a big piece of their culture. They're very family centric. So Debbie. Others. Yeah, go ahead, Charlotte. Because of your ankle injury, I assume you were not able to go see friends in the old city? No, I uh, I was in two places. I was in Nazareth one day, and then I was inside Lena and Elias's house for 10 days. Everybody had to come see me. I couldn't, I was in a wheelchair and yeah. uh, so you didn't have contact with any of the old old city people, okay? Mm -hmm. Except some people from Jerusalem came and visited me, okay. but I didn't see a bunch of people. It was a very different trip than what I expected, but it was still a wonderful trip. It was really a fun trip. So Debbie, with the with the economy being so depressed in the West Bank and and people unable to work and so forth, how are they able to manage with all like those? wonderful meals that you portrayed it's like okay how do they bring that all together are they do they grow a lot of their own things or how, well, how so, is that happening? Uh, lamb is the main piece of all of this so they um the meat they don't have any but there's chickens down in the house there's um a garden so all the greens that we ate for all the salads and stuff and all the green beans were things that were grown in their um uh their garden and then i and then, like the people that I know, Lena, they, Lena and Elias or, and Isa, all the family that work in this business, they also, um, they started the olive wood selling, right? So they're doing, they found other ways to find income. And in fact, now as a tour agency, they are starting to promote trips, Paul tours to Greece, right? Because they don't have no hope that the West Bank and Israel is going to open up anytime soon. So they're all developing different um, business models to try and make this work. But for those of you who know who Yad, who has uh, been a, a tour guide for many of you, um, I mean, I'll be honest, he came to me in tears. His second daughter, his oldest daughter just graduated from college. He doesn't have the money to send his daughter to college next year. She graduates from high school this week. And, you know, just crying and asking me if there was any way we could help. He hasn't worked. He's worked for Elias and Esau and um, done stuff at Christmas time, but they are just all in a very bad way. It's all in a very bad way. I can't, those of you who have been on this that have contributed to their GoMe fund or sent them money, um, they, 
they tell those stories with tears in their eyes of your generosity, but they're just barely holding on. I'm sure that I got actually much more of the meat than they would normally have because as a guest, they all did this. But everything's homemade. Like, we didn't eat bread that wasn't baked in, an, in the oven, right? I mean, that's one way that you reduce the cost, right? Everything is organic and everything is um, freshly made, which I don't think they actually had time to do that much of it um, before October 7th, but now they have a lot more time. Yeah. So. I mean, all these families have kids who are in school. They have kids in private school. They have kids with braces. They have kids who have music lessons, right? I mean, they have all the same lives that we have, and they're trying to make it. I remember Elia said to me at one point he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to pay the tuition for the kids for next year. But because of the Easter, that people bought stuff at Easter from the olive wood, that was enough for him to be able to pay the tuition for the year. And that's like, as long as my kids can be in school next year, We'll make it, right? So they, they hold on. And they have deep, deep faith that God will provide. Uh, Debbie, I've already got people uh, texting me and asking, is this being recorded? Which I know uh, it is being recorded. Do you know how, um, to, what I, how to respond to them to tell them how to get, get the recording? Oh. I'll put it on Facebook. Okay. And if you guys want to share the link, it's a, it'll be a, on a Google Drive link. But okay, will it be on the church to website too, Debbie? I guess I could put it on the church website. The yeah, problem is that the people that don't um, use Facebook, which several of my people that wanted to see this and couldn't today, uh, who want the recording, um, you can't uh, send anything on Facebook. For somebody who's not on Facebook, they can't open it. So if you if there oh, was on your church website, maybe I could send it through that. I'll put it on the well, it's not on the church website. What it is is on the church YouTube channel. So Mount Washington Presbyterian Church okay. YouTube channel. It'll be under a section called it's lectures or something like that. I don't know. It's got all my other lectures on it. I'll put it on there. Okay. Okay. And it's if not, please email me or text me, and I'll send you the link directly. But it, it, it'll. Is It'll take a minute for it to do all its magic before I can get up. It won't be up till tomorrow morning. Okay. Is this safe for you to do, Debbie? Is it safe? Yeah. For this, I'm not, there's no problem for me. Okay. And I'm not, I haven't said anything about anybody that would cause problems. That's okay. really why I'm, I'm, I'm like, which pictures I put up. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem. Okay. Well, we thank you for sharing. Um, thank you. We have a passion for it since we've been there two times. So I, I just feel devastated the way the politics in the U.S. are going. Mm -hmm. And um, so. Yeah. I would say the more that I would say being informed on all perspectives, right? Uh, while I certainly have a bias towards many of my Christian Palestinian friends. I'm also deeply aware of the trauma that Israel has experienced. I'm not justifying any behavior on anybody's part, but I also think it's important to enter into these conversations with an empathetic understanding of other people's points of view. When people feel heard, it's easier for you to argue your own point or share your own experience. And it's a very volatile, emotionally charged topic in Israel, in the West Bank, as well as in our country. So I think we can follow Christ in showing love and uh, listening. I think, I think you did that tonight. Thank I, you. I, and I say that honestly, because after you finished your Israeli Jewish presentation, I want, I, I thought, Susan, you've got to get some more compassion going here, <laughs> you know, they do have, and the, and the things that you said they felt, I could understand. Mm -hmm. that the power, I, the, yeah, I the, could, the, the power is disproportionate, and the justice on all sides is very uneven. But um, we still are. I I heard Johanna Catanacho, and uh, I was talking to him up in Nazareth. Many of you have met him. He's a, a Palestinian Christian theologian, and he said to me, the answer has to be love. The Christians have to lead with love and all of this. And he's saying that as a person who grew up in East Jerusalem, 
uh, has been uh, questioned at gunpoint by Israeli soldiers, and yet believes in the power of Christ's love. And I am very inspired by that. Um, so anyway, I love all of you. For some of you who I don't get to see very much in California, my love. And um, so good to see people here from Cincinnati. But thank you for being on this journey with me. Can I, can I ask you one quick question, Debbie? Sure. Is is some of that GoFund money, is that is that also helping out people like Eod too? Do you yes. know? Yes, it okay. did. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. They they spread it out to the people in the tourism industry that all of us have worked with. Okay, wonderful. So guys okay. and bus drivers and Shepherd like Dash yeah. Society. Okay. Debbie, can I read you one one line really quick from a um a Democratic politician, I don't know his name, he's not giving it here, but he says, quote, you can sway a thousand men by appealing to their prejudices quicker than you can convince one man by logic. <laughs> and probably less by love, but let's let love be our rule. Okay, love you guys. Talk to you later. Thank Take you. care. Bye.